A big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. If you need a website or a domain, go to squarespace.com forward slash James for 10% off your first purchase. Hi folks, I uh, hope you're all well. Now, Lightroom, like most pieces of software, and in fact like all editing suites that I've ever used, uh, is fairly methodical in its layout. Um, in that, I think people at Adobe had at least a few meetings uh, before releasing the software where they worked out where different things should go. I don't think Apple had those same meetings about its mail app. To be honest, it didn't seem anyone thought about that before they released it, but Lightroom, I think, did. Uh, and that's fantastic because I think largely uh, the most powerful tools are set out pretty near the top of the develop module and uh, that works quite well, I think. I mean, I say the most powerful tools, there's no official list, I don't think. This is just my opinion. But then photography is about opinions. There's no right and wrongs and there's certainly no right and wrongs when it comes to uh, deciding how you edit. Having said that, when I ever get the chance to uh, look over people's shoulders when they're editing photos, I do find it a bit strange when people open up a photo and then start tweaking the luminance of the orange or the sharpness straight away before addressing things like the exposure and the white balance. I find that a bit of a, an odd way to go about things. It's kind of like reading a novel starting at page 84, you know, odd. So here is a photo that I took in uh, October last year in the Peak District. It was a very nice morning, very crisp morning. You can see the frost on the grass and I absolutely loved it. And uh, typically with a photo like this, what I'll do is I will edit the temperature uh, and the exposure first. I mean, they are the top two sliders in Lightroom, but before even that, there's a couple of other things I'll do which appear before those sliders at the top of the develop module. And those things are crop and spot removal. Uh, anyway, I'll start off with this image explaining my methodology for cropping, which is to crop at the very start of an edit. Now, lots of photographers like to do their cropping at the end of an edit when they've done all their tone curves, they've done their shadows, their highlights, uh, the color. And I don't necessarily understand that way of thinking, primarily because I like to judge uh, things like highlights and shadows based off of looking at the histogram. Now, if we take this image, and uh, this is an edited version of the file, I should say, I'll go back to the, uh, the original version in a minute. But if we do some cropping, now keep an eye on the histogram as I make this crop. So I'll bring it in like this, and the histogram changes. I bring it in further, the histogram changes again. I bring it in further than that, the histogram changes again. The histogram will change based on what is in the cropped area, which means that if you wait to do your cropping until the very end, then you're going to be making decisions on things like highlights, your black point, your white point, uh, your shadows. You're going to be making those decisions on the histogram that may change when you crop. In other words, there might be a really bright part of your image, which you have no intention in including in the final part, but that is going to direct the decisions you make based on where your highlight slider should be. And I think that ultimately is a bit backwards. Also, there is a bit of a wider point on cropping, which is that the crop defines what the image is. Just like when you're out in the field and you're working really hard on your composition, you need to do that equally as hard uh, when you're working on cropping in your edit. You need to think, have I got this right in the field? And if not, then it requires as much thought as it did in the field when you were trying to get it right in camera in the first place. And so working on things like color before you work on what you actually want in the photo is a bit like sort of choosing the color of a new car before you know what the car is. Or choosing a carpet before you know what the room is. Uh, not brilliant examples, either of those I don't think, but you get the idea. I think it's a bit backward to do any other editing before you've done the cropping. So with this image, for example, uh, this is the final edited cropped version. But if we take everything back to how it was when I shot it, so go back to the reset, this is how I shot it, and this is before the crop. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is completely contradict myself by saying that I'm gonna adjust the exposure before the crop, but that is purely so that I can see a bit better what is in the image. So this adjustment of exposure is not to inform the final edit, it's just to inform the crop. And exactly the same goes for bringing down the highlights so I can see what we have in the sky. 
So now that we've done that, if I open the crop tool and I can see that there are some vapor trails in the sky which look a bit messy, I could choose to clone those out, but I think broadly the sky isn't really adding much in terms of atmosphere to this image. So I think I probably want to get rid of this bit of sky and that will really accentuate this hill uh, in the background as well. I think also this left hand side of the image doesn't really add much to the scene. So I think I can make a fairly uniform crop and keep the aspect ratio, broadly speaking, that the image was shot at, which is four by three. I shot this on my G9, if I remember rightly. So I think something like that works a bit better. And that has the added advantage of having this little bird right in the center of the uh, the shot. Perfect. Now from here, I can make much more informed decisions about things like color, highlights and shadows without having to worry about parts of the image that I'm not going to include in the final image anyway. And yeah, if we just go back, yeah, this is uh, this is what we ended up with the the final edit, which I've made a bit colder and made some tweaks to the color, but I, I really like how it turned out. Anyway, this is not about this image. This is about Lightroom process. Now, the next most powerful tool you'll be shocked to hear in Lightroom, I think, is the one that sits next to the crop, which is the spot removal. So here is a photo that I shot on another morning, again in the Peak District about the same time last year. And I really like this uh, this tree branch that kind of hangs over the scene. I think it completely changes the, uh, the emphasis of the photo and the feel of the scene. However, it's probably not to everybody's tastes. And I think that working out whether you want it or not is an imperative part of the first part of the edit before you work on things like shadows and highlights and color. Because again, you don't want things like shadows to be determined by things that aren't gonna be included in the original image. So if you want to remove this branch, for example, the time to do it is at the very start of the edit. Um, another example here is a mountain um, I shot in Italy with my brother Tom, just on the, uh, the edge of that rock. As you can see, there is kind of this bushy area just at the bottom of the photo, which I mean is fairly inoffensive, but I think to make the photo a lot more dramatic, it works better to get rid of it. So again, I cloned that out. Now a lot of the time when I'm doing that kind of cloning, to be honest, I just use Photoshop because I think the clone tool in Photoshop is much more powerful, much more intuitive, and works much better when you're cloning out large parts of a photo. I mean, the clue is in the name in Lightroom, it's called spot removal, not the clone stamp tool. But yeah, the tool in Lightroom is very good, very useful, particularly for small things, and it's worth considering using it before you do anything with any of the sliders. Except for, as I mentioned in the, uh, the crop segment, using things like exposure and highlights and shadows just to inform what you want removed and what you want kept. And then when you've done that, they can all go back to zero and you can start the edit proper. Now, I do believe that there are five really powerful tools in this, uh, this section of tools right at the top of the develop module. And as you'll count, there are actually six tools involved. The thing is, I for one have never ever used the red eye tool. Now I understand that Lightroom is set up for uh, all kinds of different photographers and for event photographers, wedding photographers, people like that, it's probably a fantastic tool, but I've never used it. The only thing that I use the red eye correction tool for is kind of really as like a, a breakwater between the crop and the spot removal tool and the other tools in this little section of Lightroom that I use at the end of an edit. So before the red eye tool are the tools that I use at the start of an edit and after the red eye tool are the tools that I use at the end of an edit is how I think about it. Right, I shall now very quickly demonstrate the, uh, the power of the graduated filter tool, which is the first tool after the, uh, the breakwater as I called it, a bit of a strange term really now that I think about it. But I'm gonna do this very quickly because I've done a whole video uh, on this tool, on this image in fact. So if we select the, uh, the graduated filter tool, this is post all the other edits. So I've played around with the sliders of this image, I'm happy with what I've got, and now I just wanna make some changes to a part of the image, specifically the sky. So I'm gonna bring down the graduated filter, and I'm gonna bring down the exposure, something like that. 
perfect. Now, as I described in the video that I've just mentioned, the range mask uh, in this particular tool is fantastic, and also in the next tool that we're gonna use. Really, really powerful, I love it. Particularly in an image like this, because as you can see, I've actually made the birds darker, as well as the sky, which I actually didn't want to do. So I'm gonna go to range mask, and rather than it be off, I'm gonna select luminance, and then I'm gonna get the picker, and I'm just gonna select anywhere in the dark sky, and as you can see, by doing that, it just selects the sky and unselects all the brighter parts of the image that therefore aren't the sky. In other words, the birds. And this can be tweaked like so, using these sliders to uh, select the range that I want, either included or not included. And I can check this show mask luminance if you want to see a bit more clearly what's included in the selection and what's not. Fantastic tool, if you're interested, like I say, check out that video that I've mentioned. Similarly, I love to use the radial filter in most of my images, and I'll show you an example of when I like to use it most. So, here is an image that I shot uh, a couple of months ago of the lighthouse in Anglesey, uh, New Beach. Fantastic lighthouse, very sort of, um, I don't know, famous is a bit strong, but lots of people take photos here. It's quite a popular spot to take photos. And this, to be honest, is not far off of the final edit. The problem that I've got with it at the moment, though, is that you can see this kind of messy sky in the background, which I don't really think adds all that much to the photo. And you can get rid of most of that by uh, just bringing the highlights up. As you can see, that does a fairly good job. But there is still a bit of detail that I don't particularly want. I'd prefer to have that removed. One of my favorite ways to do that is get a radial filter and treat it like a beam of light, basically. So if we stick it over here, somewhere we presume the sun to be, and I can't really tell where the sun is in this photo, but I think it's just at the corner of the image. If I remember rightly, I think that's how I framed it. Uh, so something like this, and then I'm just gonna boost the exposure, and I'm also gonna boost the temperature because the sun, particularly at this time of day, gives off a very warm light. So something like, let's just go mad with this for the sake of argument, something like that. I'm gonna make the filter bigger. Go even brighter. Yes, look at that. Lovely stuff even bigger, something like that. Looks pretty good, I think, and I love to do this anytime I've got any kind of source of light in my photos, which is most of the time. Uh, now, at the minute, this doesn't look particularly realistic because the water is being affected much more than it would be in real life. So again, I'm gonna use the range mask tool and I'm just gonna select the sky like so and that removes the selection from the water. And I do want a bit more of the brightness on the water than that. Something like that maybe, but definitely not that. I think that's just way too much. So something like that, I think looks pretty good. And that is a fantastic way of getting rid of sort of messy clouds that you don't want included in the photo. And it also kind of creates a, a point of interest in terms of light. Now you can move this around if you get lucky on a day like this where you can't really tell where the sun is. You do need to wait until it's pretty much sunset. And also you do need to be really careful with things like shadows because if shadows are wrong in an image, your eyes recognize it straight away and it just looks a bit odd. But in this example, it's pretty straightforward to uh, to move this beam of light around. So something like that also looks, well, a bit strong there actually, to be honest, but not terrible. And then the last most powerful tool, as you might expect, is uh, the brush tool. And I've mentioned before, I think on this channel, that I think a lot of the time people um, overemphasize the importance of global adjustments. And they make changes to things like clarity, texture, sharpness, dehaze. They make those changes on a global level that affect the entire image. Now in most photos, we want to emphasize certain things and not to emphasize others. And we'd be better using them with the brush tool, for example, where you can emphasize different parts of a photo. And nowhere is that more obvious than a portrait. Uh, so here is a photo of a very nice gentleman that I took in Sri Lanka. He was very kind. We had one of those chats where neither of us spoke each other's language, but you kind of understand much more than you should be able to, given that you don't understand a word each other are saying, literally. We had, it must have been about a three minute chat, and I don't know how we understood each other, but uh, 
it felt like a good talk. Anyway, as I say, very kind, let me take a photo of him. And if I was to make adjustments to, let's say, the clarity, then that would obviously bring clarity to the background as well, and I absolutely don't want to do that. There's a reason that the background is out of focus, that I used a relatively shallow depth of field, because it's not as important to the photo as the face. So why would I want to introduce clarity and texture and dehaze and sharpness to other parts of the photo that aren't him? So obviously by using the brush tool, I can just make changes to very small parts of the photo. In this case, I want to make those changes to his eyes. Now I know for the most part, this is really quite obvious, but if you're a beginner, perhaps you didn't know uh, about the brush tool and why you would want to use the brush tool over the global sliders and uh, yeah, an important point, I think. So yes, there we have it, the, uh, the five most powerful tools in Lightroom, in my opinion, and uh, to me, it's no coincidence that they sit right at the top of the develop module, along with the red eye correction tool, which I, I don't think, I mean, it probably is powerful, actually, it's just not, for me at least, particularly useful. Anyway, a huge thank you for watching and a big thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. So if you're looking to build a website and particularly an online store, I know lots of photographers uh, get in touch with me and say they're looking to sell prints and asking for advice on how they should do it. Squarespace is a fantastic solution for it. So basically once you've uploaded one product, you can quite easily duplicate that product and just make changes to the title of the product, the photos of the product, and it basically saves a whole load of time uh, when you're uploading more than one product to your site. And Squarespace is the only solution I've ever considered using for selling my products because it's so easy to use, so simple to set up, and so reliable. And so yeah, if you're interested in selling prints or books or presets yourself, then I'd really recommend checking out Squarespace as a tool to do it. So if that's you, then go to squarespace.com to start your free trial. And after that, if you'd like to make a purchase, then go to squarespace.com forward slash James for 10% off that purchase. And a big thank you to Squarespace for their continued support of this channel. Also, a big thank you to everyone who left a comment saying that you'd like a print last week for the print giveaway. I've chosen winners. I don't know where they all live yet. They've not all responded to uh, my correspondence trying to get in touch with them, but I know that at least one of them is in America and so far two are in the UK. So not a bad result in terms of shipping costs for me so far. And in next week's video, I think I'll be talking about this, which is uh, my new tripod. You didn't think I'd do a video about a tripod, did you? But uh, yes, I, I am gonna make a video about a tripod. It's not gonna be sponsored. I did pay for this, and I'll tell you why I paid for it next time. Hopefully outside in some way. Probably local, but uh, yes, hopefully outside if it stops raining. Anyway, yeah, I'm waffling again. Thank you for watching. I'll see you then.